ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Modern Life is Goodish. My name's Dave Gorman. I have a laptop, a remote control, and a big screen. And I wanted to start this particular show with a discussion of manners. And it occurs to me that I usually address you and all audiences as a mass, as a group. You never really become individuals to me. And so I was thinking, maybe this week it'd be nice and polite if I said a quick hello to just uh, at least one of you. Uh, I'll come down here and just say a quick hello to you. So what's your name there, fella? Jason. Jason, nice to meet you, Jason. And are you a local man, Jason? Uh, Kent. From Kent, OK, yeah, so you've travelled a little bit. What, what do you do for yourself in, in Kent? What do you? IT. You're in IT. OK, everyone is these days, aren't they, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> Bit of a busman's holiday in some ways, isn't it? This coming out to an IT thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, it's just a nice, it's just a little chat. That's all it is. Nothing, nothing untowards. <laughs> nothing untowards. Uh, but I'm just saying, I, I did that for a reason. Like, you know, I did that for a reason. Obviously, Jason, he's a very well brought up man. He's very polite. When I offered my hand there, he was straight there, wasn't he? Shaking it. Because he knows that is how polite people behave in modern society. I like that in you, Jason. Well done, you. Not everyone is so well disposed, are they? I have met a man who did not know how to shake hands. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the man I am talking about. <laughs> if you don't know him, his name is Alex Reed. He is best known, I think, for having once been married to Jordan, uh, but I believe he plies his trade as a cage fighter. Uh, incidentally, that screen is there for information purposes. Uh, it's not a scaled up version of his business card. Um, <laughs> although it would be magnificent if it were. <laughs> Now, if I'm going to tell you that I met Alex Reed, my ego insists that I make it very clear I was not working with Alex Reed. I was working in the same building as Alex Reed. I was in the makeup chair having my brow tended to by a young lady in Wart Alex. I did what polite people do. I am polite. I'm also a very good liar. I said, I said, it's nice to meet you, didn't I? Yeah. I offered him my hand. He stared at that hand like it was some kind of foreign alien object. He'd never seen the like before. And then he did this. <laughs> Tried to turn my handshake into a bloody fist bump. I don't think that's fair. If he'd started it, if he'd walked in and gone, all right, fella, I'd have been right there with the bump, wouldn't I? Because the person who starts the greeting runs the greeting, don't they? Those are the rules you join in with whoever starts it. And I started it with a handshake. He is being all alpha male, wasn't he? He's thinking, no, no, I'm in charge here. I'll show him who's top dog. He's trying to force me to turn my handshake into a fist bump. And I'm embarrassed to tell you, but I did. I yielded, ladies and gentlemen. I gave him a fist bump. And I saw him after that. He had a bit of a cocky swagger in him, thinking, yeah, I showed him. He knows who's in charge. Little does he know, ladies and gentlemen, secretly, up here, I was playing stone, scissors, paper. So I win. <laughs> I win. That's the important thing. In fact, I win twice, because when he sat down in the makeup chair, he proceeded to explain exactly how many cold sores he had, and I was left feeling quite pleased that we hadn't pressed any more flesh than was strictly speaking necessary. <laughs> While most people share a view of what constitutes good manners in person, I think things change a little when we go online. Many of us become a little less gracious. Something happens to us. We become disinhibited in some way. I noticed it very much after I got married. Here I am, ladies and gentlemen, on my wedding day, and you might think that that was not an appropriate outfit for that wedding, but let me tell you, we are made for each other. We really are. <laughs> anyway, after I got married, a couple of things happened. One of the things was that people saw pictures of me and my new bride, and I found complete strangers started contacting me via Twitter or email or Facebook, and they would say, you're punching above your weight, eh? 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 Never met you before, have I? Calling you ugly? I don't think that's a very nice thing to say to a stranger. Now, another thing that happened after I got married is I put on some weight. In the first three months of being married, I put on two stones in weight. I swelled up to 14 and a half stone. Now, there is a reason for that. The reason is Mrs Gorman's hobby is baking cakes. But Mrs Gorman doesn't eat cakes. She is allergic to wheat. <laughs> Bobby is baking things that she can't eat. A fresh cake would arrive on the kitchen counter every other day, and I'm the only other sod who lives there, aren't I? And I would eat the cakes because I am polite. And I like cakes. Not a lot, but I like them. And people, complete strangers, would see me at my top weight of 14 and a half stones, and they would, without any compunction, the same people would get in touch by email or by Twitter, saying, oh, you're carrying a bit of timber, yeah? Hey, hey, never met you before, calling you porky. 
I made one TV show at my 14 and a half stone top weight. It was on the air for one hour. During that hour, 184 separate individuals got in touch to tell me I was fat. <laughs> More than three a minute for an hour. That wasn't the jolliest hour of my life, thank you very much. Now, in truth, I'll be honest with you, I'm quite thick-skinned about this sort of stuff. In fact, I reckon that extra half stone I'm still carrying is largely thick skin. <laughs> but the thing that winds me up about messages like this is that they're bloody contradictory, aren't they? If this is the timeline here, ladies and gentlemen, and that there is my weight, and that there is where I'm punching, well, surely, as my weight increases, there should be less room left above it for punching, shouldn't there? <laughs> At some point, I should be in negative equity. I should be punching below my weight, shouldn't I? Except it doesn't really work like that, does it? That's not what they're really talking about. What they're talking about is the attractiveness quotient, aren't they? On the attractiveness quotient graph, there's me there, and there's Mrs Gorman there, who I freely admit is a more visually stimulating individual than I. Now, we got married on the 8th of October 2010. That is the day on which the cakes started arriving. <laughs> That is the day I started piling on the pounds. That is when I started lowering my attractiveness quotient while Mrs Gorman carries on at her usual gorgeous level. What she's doing there, secretly, with her so-called hobby of baking cakes, is she is making herself exponentially more attractive, isn't she? That's what she's up to. I'm on to her plan. That is why I have banned the baking of cakes in the Gorman household. They are allowed, but only for other people's birthdays, and the cake must leave the house. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you more about some of the other weird messages I receive from total strangers when we come back from this short break. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Gorman and this is Modern Life is Goodish. And before the break, I was talking about some of the strange tweets and emails I receive. And this is not a new phenomenon. Hand on heart, there has not been a day in the last eight or nine years where I have not been told that I look like someone else. At least once in a day. And on only three occasions in those nine years has the person I'm being told I look like looked even remotely like me. <laughs> This happens all the time, genuinely, at present, on average 10 or 12 times a week. I'll give you some examples. This is the letter from this girl, Charlotte Tom. Dear Mr Gorman, please find below a picture of a mate of mine who I believe looks uncannily like you. Uncannily. That is her choice of word. Uncannily. I don't really see it myself, Charlotte. Not really, no. <laughs> I'm not convinced. But I wanted to see if I could breathe life into the imagination of Charlotte Tom. I wanted to see if I could look like her friend, Andy from Tooting. So I gave my camera to Mrs Gorman and I tried my hardest to resemble Andy from Tooting. I don't think we get there, ladies and gentlemen. I just don't think we do. It's not. It's not really the same thing, is it? Not really. Not really. Nothing like him, is it? Not really. This one, this is a review of a Swedish heavy metal band. The Haunted needn't worry if their career in extreme music ever dries up. They could try their luck as look-alike artists. Vocalist Peter Dolving is Dave Gorman's long-lost brother. He could be my long-lost brother. <laughs> How long's he been lost for? That's what I'd like to know. Nothing bloody like me. I tried my hardest to see if I could breathe life into the imagination here. I gave my camera to Mrs Gorman. I tried my hardest to resemble Peter Dolving of The Haunted again. I don't think we get there. <laughs> not really, not in any meaningful way. Nothing like him, is it? This one up here, I didn't realise this was a look-alike when I first saw it. I thought someone was being nice to me. Oh, lovely. Dave Gorman's looking buffer these days, isn't he? And a picture link. This one arrived not long after 184 people had told me I was fat. I thought somebody had finally found a thin picture of me. I had a little skip of joy in my heart as I clicked on that link, didn't I? <laughs> I gave my camera to Mrs Gorman. <laughs> I didn't really, and you wouldn't have respected me if I had. You wouldn't have respected me, you know you wouldn't. You wouldn't have respected that. 
why does this keep happening? I'll tell you why it keeps happening. What all these people have got in common is that they have got brownish hair and reddish beards. <laughs> you people are beard blind, aren't you? As far as you're concerned, I look like that. As far as you're concerned, that looks just like me. That doesn't look anything like me. That is Rod Hole without emu. Nothing like me whatsoever. It's all very well, you lot chuckling at this. You're all sitting there pretending, oh, I wouldn't have done that. I don't think he looks like those people. You think you're better. You're not. You are just as bad. You can't tell me apart from these people either. I know you can't. You thought you were watching me in the first part of this show, didn't you? You remember when I was talking about shaking hands with Alex Reed? Do you remember that? Yeah? That wasn't me. That wasn't me at all. That was Charlotte Tom's mate, Andy in Tooting. That was that fella. <laughs> If you don't believe me, I've got it on tape, here it is. Secretly, up here, I was playing stone, scissors, paper. There you go, you see? Maybe, maybe he is uncannily like me after all. Do you remember when I talked about putting on weight? Do you remember that? Yeah? You thought that was me, didn't you? That wasn't me either, that was my mate Steve, that's who that was. <laughs> uh, if you don't believe me, I've got the evidence, here it is. First three months of being married, I put on two stone in weight. I swelled up to 14 and a half stone. Yeah. None of you noticed. Do you remember when I was talking about how much I like cakes? Do you remember that? Yeah? That wasn't me either. That was Paul Daniels. <laughs> I've got the tape with me. I like cakes. Not a lot, but I like them. You see, you're just as bad. You're every bit as bad. Just as bad. Now, while I have been getting weird messages from people for a long time, the frequency with which they arrive is definitely increasing. And the reason for that is obvious, I would think. It's just so much easier to do. We live in an age of instant communication. Ten years ago, most people wouldn't have bothered to send me a postcard telling me I look like someone I don't actually look like, but they'll tweet it to me because they can, because it's there. And in many ways, that is brilliant. And yet, at the same time, I can't help thinking that when you make communication easier, you also devalue each unit of communication. You would all, for example, prefer to receive a birthday card from a friend than a birthday text from a friend. The message it contains is exactly the same, but you all appreciate the effort that someone has gone to. And that's true, I think, with all communication. The government is on board with this kind of easy communication. There is a government website that allows you to create an e-petition. It's supposed to boost political engagement, but personally, I have my doubts. This is on the website where it explains what are e-petitions. And as you can see, e-petitions are an easy, personal way for you to influence government. Really? I'm not so sure that's true. I think they're an easy personal way for you to pretend that you're being listened to by the government. And if you get 100,000 signatures, your e-petition could be debated in the House of Commons. Am I the only one who finds the words could be <laughs> leaping out at him? Not will be, could be if they feel like it, if they've got the time. When I checked the other day, uh, there were more e-petitions that have been suggested and rejected than have ever been accepted, gone live and run their full course. So just for a bit of fun, I thought I'd show you three different petitions and we'd see what happened to them, see if you could guess which one was rejected. One of them was rejected, the other two weren't. One goes with tax on foreign holidays. Two goes with poverty. <laughs> three goes with tax the rich. The next stage is to write the body of your petition, and there are some guidelines, as you can see. It tells you, keep your petition details short and to the point. You must say what action you want the government to take. So let's have a look and see how the three of our petitions fared on that front. Petition number one, which as we know is tax on foreign holidays, has gone with this. The government should have a tiered taxation policy depending on the number of foreign holidays a person takes in a year. If this stops people from holidaying abroad, it is not our economy that suffers. I think we're all pretty clear what it is they want the government to do there. Petition number two, the poverty petition, goes with this. Poverty, not really important. <laughs> Actually, it is. Poverty has been increasing immensely, and we should do our best to eradicate it. It starts with you at home, not taking things for granted, but appreciating it. <laughs> What's little for us is huge for them, so make it count. End of petition. <laughs> I don't know what they want the government to do, I've no idea. Tax the rich has gone with, tax the rich, they can afford to pay. <laughs>
There you go. Three different e-petitions. You've seen them in all their glory. My question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is which one do you think was rejected? All those, by show of hands, maybe a bit of noise, all those who think that it could have been tax on foreign holidays. Anyone? Anyone think that one was rejected? Two, three, four people? OK, who thinks that poverty was rejected? Yeah. yeah. That's certainly, OK, that's clear majority. Who thinks that tax the rich? Anyone out there? <coughs> a few of you, OK. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I've misled you ever so slightly. Um, only one of these actually made it onto the website and went live. Two of them were rejected. Let's take a closer look. Tax on foreign holidays, ladies and gentlemen, was rejected because e-petitions cannot be used to request action on issues that are outside the responsibility of the government. Who knew that choosing what level of tax we impose on particular activities was outside the responsibility of the government? I thought that's exactly what they did, but apparently not. That's the reason that one's being rejected. Tax the rich that says tax the rich, they can afford to pay, has been rejected with the following reason. It did not have a clear statement explaining what action you want the government to take. <laughs> That's all it bloody had. <laughs> Nothing else. It's bloody obvious what they want you to do. That one was rejected. Poverty, ladies and gentlemen, has gone live. It has been published. There. You can sign it. There you go. Any time between now and the 5th of June next year, you can join Roberta, who is so far the only signatory. <laughs> but if 99,999 other people sign it, the parliamentary authorities are obliged to consider whether or not they should have a debate about whether or not we should try to solve poverty by all appreciating things more. <laughs> I tell you, I love looking through the e-petitions. Those ones with just one signature, they are my favourite. They are, incidentally, 15% of the total of existing open petitions. Imagine being so motivated about an issue that you think, right, I'm going to give the government a piece of my mind about this. I'm going to start a petition and then not mention it to my wife or my husband or my colleagues at work or anyone else. But some of them are genuinely amazing. For example... Look at this. Scrap current coinage due to its obscene and unusual design revert to previous. This has been published on the website, ladies and gentlemen. This is out there. It's wonderful. It really is. The 2008 coinage design is visually offensive and sexually explicit <laughs> to the point of obscenity. The new design is cleverly contrived and features a phallus. <laughs> when all the coins are arranged in their proper form, the shield design can be seen, and it is clear that an obvious phallus has been incorporated into the Irish harp. It's on the back of the 50p, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you've all seen it, haven't you? I've looked into it. I'll tell you what, I have found the phallus. And I will tell you exactly where it is when we come back from this short break. <laughs> Modern life is goodish, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dave Gorman. And before the break, I was talking about this e-petition submitted to the government's own website where someone is trying to persuade them to withdraw the coinage of 2008 and revert to the previous design because there is a phallus on the 50p piece. And I have found the phallus. Or at least I think I have. These are the coins that we use uh, below the £2 coin as the £1 and, and the smaller denominations. Uh, a lot of people don't know that if you combine them, they reveal the shield. Uh, now, you can see the phallus on the 50p. You have to zoom in, though, uh, and you really have to get quite far in. You have to get into the detail. Um, it will, as we travel in, <laughs> it will suddenly leap out at you. I promise you, it is in there. Just look there. I mean... <laughs> there it was. She's there all along. <laughs> if someone's just walking into the living room now and, and <laughs> looking at this on telly, they're going to think somebody else has graffitied the telly. <laughs> they, anyway, there isn't a phallus in there. There really isn't. The man is mad, surely. I've had a careful look, though. I, th I think I know what he's talking about, I think. Um, if you look at the, the 50p uh, and, I guess, the five pence, it's possible, it is possible he's talking about that as the phallus. Uh, it's also possible he's talking about that as the phallus. But I don't think either of them are really phalli, are they? Not, not really. His petition goes on to say, This phallus 
is not a traditional part of the harp of the royal shield. And he's right there, it's not. Neither is it a part of the coins he's looking at either. His petition ends by saying, I will also start a petition that calls for criminal charges to be brought to the perpetrators of this monstrous act of cultural vandalism. There are loads of petitions that make me scratch my head. There are loads where you think, surely that's more of a local issue. This is the sort of thing I mean. Lower streetlights in Aberystwyth. <laughs> and incidentally, he doesn't mean make them dimmer. He means make them lower. <laughs> Here, he sets out his case. About us, there is a wonderful star-filled sky, but in the town of Aberystwyth, it is being obscured by extremely high streetlights. I'm not suggesting we turn off any, but simply lower them, and then we may get a clearer view of the beautiful natural lights above us. Those stars are a hundred million miles away. <laughs> Moving a street light from 15 feet to 12 feet off the ground, I don't think it's going to make a huge amount of difference. Surely, the only way in which they won't interfere with your view of the night sky is if you move them below head height. <laughs> and I think if you do that, you've lost sight of what it is they're there for. The population of Aberystwyth, incidentally, is approximately 16,000 people. He needs every single person who lives there and 84,000 other people who've no reason to give a shit to sign his petition in order for anyone to pay it any attention. Is that great a political engagement? I don't think so. Petitions being too local is definitely a running theme on the site. This is a favourite. Uh, relief buses to be implemented during peak usage times outside Wilson's school. <laughs> At no point during this petition, which has been published, does it mention which town Wilson School is in. <laughs> For all I know, their son is called Wilson and they're talking about their son's school. <laughs> one of the other recurring types is the kind of retaliatory petition. Here's another one that's only got one signature. Allow sales of fireworks to the public and stop the ban everything brigade. Yeah, yeah, let's bloody show them. Yeah. I see the Ban Everything Brigade is out in force, so let's do something against them. Yeah, yeah, let's ban the Ban Everything Brigade, yeah? Ah, oh, no, don't, that's what they bloody want, yeah. <laughs> there is nothing, and I repeat, nothing, wrong with selling fireworks to anyone who wants them. <laughs> really? Maybe you want to think back to why it is we have fireworks in the first place. Allowing those people to have fun and enjoy themselves. I am not a miserable old git, neither do I want to be. So let's have a bit more tolerance of people. And my favourite detail about this petition is that it closes on the 6th of November. <laughs> Which I can't help feeling. I can't help feeling that is a day too late for Dave's purposes. There's no consistency about the way they run this site. This petition, for example, Apple should open a store in Leeds. <laughs> right? This one was rejected. And I understand why, with good reason, obviously. Because it says e-petitions cannot be used to request action on issues that are outside the responsibility of the government. That makes sense. But if that was rejected, why was this? Open a TGI Friday's restaurant in Hull, accepted. <laughs> This is published! Imagine the amount of tourists we are going to have in the city having recently been voted the City of Culture 2017. And we can't even offer them the sumptuous taste of a Jack Daniels burger. <laughs> so come on everybody, let's get this out there and bring TGI Fridays to Hull. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, if 100,000 people from Hull sign that, they should take the bloody City of Culture away from them. <laughs> Not, I should say, that there aren't some petitions that make some sense. There are some beautiful ideas out there. Somebody, finally, all petrol stations signal if toilet's working now. <laughs> oh, good for you, sir. Finally, someone talking sense in this universe. This is exactly what Westminster should be dealing with, isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you, Nigel Carter. This petition is written with a lovely, enjoyable degree of urgency. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's the number of times he uses the word now. <laughs> you can't help but read it with that sense of urgency. It's a wonderful thing. Passing drivers must be able to see from their car whether a petrol station has a working and available toilet now from the road before they slow down. If closed for any reason, the sign must warn the driver now not to stop here now as no toilet is actually usable at this moment. 
vital for so many drivers. Am I the only one who imagines this was written while wearing soggy trousers? I don't think I am, am I? This is basically an online wishing well. Isn't it? That's all it is. You toss your idea in, you won't even hear a splash, but you've had your say. You see, instant, easy communication isn't always better. There are other downsides, of course, to instant communication. It makes it easier to make mistakes, doesn't it? In the past, I think it would have been very hard to accidentally post a naked photo of yourself to someone else, wouldn't it? But now it's easy, isn't it? And it seems people manage to post naked photos of themselves all the time on the internet for the whole world to see. There's a famous example, not so long ago, involving the Coronation Street actress, Michelle Keegan. This is how the Mail reported it, although, to be honest, even though they've covered up uh, the rudest bits, I feel a bit uncomfortable. I hope you don't mind, I'm going to take that away. They follow you around the room, I find. <laughs> now, what happened is that a photo of some breasts in the bath was posted on her Twitter account. She says it wasn't her and that those were not her breasts but it was on her Twitter account. And we do know that she was in the bath at around that time because the booby picture showed up not long after she had tweeted a picture of her toes in the bath. But she says that a friend hacked into her account and tweeted a picture of somebody else's breasts and it's got nothing to do with her. Maybe she's right and maybe she's wrong. I don't know. Here is her denial in the Metro. Uh, here it is in the Daily Star. And of course, it was all over the internet. You can imagine what the internet was like on the day that this happened and the days that followed. People getting all of a fluster. Oh, were they Michelle Keegan's boobs, weren't they? Is it important? Should we look at them? All this debate raging about something that doesn't really matter. And oh, I like that. I, I have a little hobby. When I see people getting all worked up about things that don't really matter, I like to take their words and turn them into something more beautiful. I visited half a dozen news sites where people were discussing this particular story. I've taken some of the comments I found there and turned them into something that I like to call a found poem, which I would like to perform for you now. OMJ! Keegan's Bazumbas. I used to like Michael Keegan. Not because she is a pretty girl, although that cannot be denied, but because she seemed to be the kind of girl who wouldn't take pictures of her breasts in the bath and share them on the World Wide Web. How wrong I was. Bath breasts, bubbles and boobs, Boobs and bubbles. Fwa. <laughs> of course they are hers. She is what my mother would call an attention-seeking floppet. <laughs> Why do people say attention-seeking as if it is a bad thing? Don't we all seek attention? She certainly has my attention. <laughs> Why, oh why, is the world going crazy over a pair of breasts? That's all they are. Breasts. We all have them. <laughs> if Michelle Keegan says that is not a picture of her bits, then I, for one, believe her. Who are we to doubt Michelle Keegan? Only Michelle Keegan really knows what Michelle Keegan has or has not done with Michelle Keegan's breasts. <laughs> Well, I feel sorry for her. <laughs> the pic was obvs intended for her boyf. It's just a misfortunate accident that we can all take advantage of. <laughs> I would drink that bath water. <laughs> Actresses have changed since my day. What next? Judy Dench tweeting a picture of her tuppence. <laughs> the important thing here is to establish the truth of the matter. There are two key questions. One, are they hers? And two, was it a mistake or not? 
If they are hers and this was a mistake, then it is wrong for any men, or indeed women, to enjoy this picture. <laughs> However, if this was done on purpose, or they are someone else's, then it is fine. <laughs> that is why the truth is important in this regard. There are already plenty of breast pics on the internet, and now there is one more. Me, yawn. Hubby, fwar. <laughs> In other words, fwarn. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> the Bill Ross Green Quartet, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you after the break. To Modern Life is Goodish, where we have been discussing just how easy communication has become in the modern world. And in this age of instant communication, where we can all just reach out and connect with almost anyone, it's interesting to me that some people have still struggled to connect with that special someone. And sometimes they try more traditional, old-fashioned methods of communication. For example, a lot of newspapers have one of those I spy columns. You know, the sort of thing, oh, I saw you on the number 38 bus on Tuesday, you were looking hot, that kind of thing. The Metro has one, it's called Rush Hour Crush. Uh, love, well, lust, is all around us, as is proven proven by the messages left by our commuter cupids. Are they talking about you? Oh, I love the rush hour crush. What I love is seeing how many people use it in ways that give them no chance whatsoever of connecting. This is the sort of thing I mean. Uh, to the tall, dark, handsome man wearing a beige coat who got on at Oxford Circus. Coffee? Brunette with headphones. You haven't even said what time of day it was, what day it was, what line we were on. Do you know how busy Oxford Circus is? It's like bloody Piccadilly Circus down there, I tell you. You get loads like this. These are amazing to me. To the blonde in the red dress on the westbound Jubilee line just before 9am on Friday. I kept smiling at you, but you were busy with your iPhone. Drink? She didn't look at you. <laughs> she has no idea who you are. The answer is clearly no, guy in grey fleece, no. I've been following this column for ages and you hardly ever see a reply. It's very exciting when you do see one. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, to the fiery ginger girl with long locks. You had a hole in your tights that made me smile. You got on the Piccadilly line at Knightsbridge can I buy you a fish bowl and a schnitzel? <laughs> Signed, mysterious man in black coat with chin spots. <laughs> that romantic missive got a reply saying this to the mysterious man in the black coat with chin spots. I was hoping no one had noticed the hole in my tights. I would like to know more over a fish bowl. This cannot be genuine, can it? Surely this is a drug deal being arranged, isn't it? <laughs> you almost never see a real reply, not a reply you can believe in. It is so exciting when you do. There was one a little while ago. There was a reply. This girl has written in saying, uh, to the gorgeous guy who works in the coffee shop at Letchworth Garden City Station. How many times do I have to smile and make conversation before you ask me out? Signed, cappuccino, one sugar. And that's, that's a fundamental error on her part right there, isn't it? The guy works in a coffee shop. <laughs> Cappuccino One Sugar is highly unlikely to be a rare order in a busy train station coffee shop, is it? He doesn't know who you are. He's got no way of identifying you from the crowd of other customers, which is why I think she got the reply that she did. It came from not one, but from two people, ladies and gentlemen. Cappuccino One Sugar. There are two guys who work in Letchworth Garden City train station coffee shop. Give us a clue. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I love the day in the shop. I love thinking about the idea of these two guys. Saying, Who do you think it is? Which one of us do you think it is? Because you know that secretly, deep down, they both know. <laughs> There's a hot guy there going, oh, it could be you, it could be me. And you know deep down he's thinking, it's me. <laughs> and the other guy there, he's so flattered by being asked the question, he's thinking, yeah, okay, yeah, I suppose it could be me, yeah. Well, why not? Let's ask. But really, he's sitting there thinking, it's him. <laughs> He knows it's the hot guy. It is weird, though. They've got to reply, haven't they? She must read the Metro. 
She must have known that this was there, so now she's bound to reply, giving them a clue. So I tuned into the column every day for a week or so. Nothing, nothing turned up. It was a bit disappointing. And after a while, I thought, you know what? This story isn't going anywhere. Somebody needs to move this story on. <laughs> and really, it's almost my public duty <laughs> to stick my oar in and stir the pot in some small way. You can't just make stuff up. You've got to know your territory, haven't you? You've got to know what you're talking about. So I went on a little road trip uh, <laughs> to Letchworth, the world's first garden city. There it is. The world's first garden city. I'm not exactly sure what a garden city is. I presume it means they've provided green open spaces and they're proud of the amount of greenery they provide, which I hope explains this beautiful display at <laughs> the train station. Be very proud of yourselves, Letchworth. That's a wonderful thing you've done there. <laughs> anyway, there is only one coffee shop in the train station. It is called Rico's. Uh, there it is, ladies and gentlemen, and there I am outside Rico's. And you know what? It was very small, it was quite pokey, you wouldn't get many people in there, a long queue would definitely be leaving the building. So having done my research, I had to then think about my motivation. And if you think about this, it's quite tricky, because these are real people. Cappuccino One Sugar wants to get with the hot guy in the coffee shop. And for all we know, he wants to get with Cappuccino One Sugar. If I send something pretending to be one of them, that's really not very fair. If I send something pretending to be some hot, attractive guy who's stealing her away or stealing him away, that's not fair either, because I'm making this guy up. If it splits up a couple who haven't even got together yet, that's messing with real people's real lives. So in the end, I thought the only morally appropriate thing to do was to send a message from someone who was an out-and-out -out cock. <laughs> because then, if she's attracted by that, well then the guys in the coffee shop are well shot of her, and if she isn't, then she might be encouraged to be bolder to go forth and speak to the people in Rico's. So I sent a message, I didn't expect it to get in, I just sent an email to the Metro from a made-up email address, but it did get in and it was very exciting. Here is my message in the Rush Hour Crush. They gave the whole column to me on this particular occasion. <laughs> Cappuccino, one sugar. If you're the girl I think you are, I'm often in the queue behind you at Letchworth Garden City Station's coffee shop. I've tried flirting, but you're too busy trying to get the attention of the guy behind the counter. <laughs> I'm training to be a barrister. You're ignoring me for a barista. <laughs> Please turn around so we can discuss my briefs. <laughs> Signed, shiny shoes, English breakfast tea. And I'll tell you what, when I saw that in the Metro at the breakfast table, me and Mrs Gorman had a high five. That was... <laughs> we were very happy with our day's work at that point. I wasn't expecting it to get in, I was delighted. I definitely wasn't expecting to see it cause a fuss, but it did. Twitter got into a bit of a flap about it. <laughs> Honestly, oh, loads of messages like this. Today's rush hour crush just nearly made me throw up. <laughs> Had this fella, bloody hell, I wasn't expecting that. And this best rush hour crush ever. Thank you, Twitter, for spreading the Metro love. Yeah, I'm loving the Letchworth Station coffee shop love triangle in the Metro. <laughs> love triangle. Will they, won't they? This is very exciting. I've never been in a love triangle before. And she wasn't the only person calling it that. There was loads. Anyone else gripped by the Letchworth coffee shop love triangle? There were loads of people gripped by it, not just me and not just them. In the Metro, they also have a send us your text column. You can send them a text on any subject. And someone sent them one saying, anyone else waiting to hear what happened with the coffee shop love triangle in Rush Hour Crutch? Did she choose the barrister or the barista? God, it's amazing, isn't it? This chap, he speaks with knowledge. He must be from Letchworth. I see this barrister thing in the Metro. I know the coffee shop in Letchworth Station as it goes. <laughs> A certain shiny shoes might find a coffee-stained boot up his ass with the quickness. <laughs> <laughs> and some people got surprisingly aggressive. Look at this. Oh, local trainee barrister from Letchworth shows himself to be total cock whilst trying to appear to be romantic. <laughs> the weird thing is, that is exactly the effect I was going for. <laughs> for what I think are morally sound reasons, and yet, when I see somebody else saying it, I start getting all defensive. <laughs> like it's actually me. It's just a made-up guy. And there were loads of them like this. What a douche. Perfect word, douche. <laughs> douche was a big theme for this fella. A-plus in douchebaggery. <laughs> that... 
that led to the Sunday people, the Sunday people no less, describing me, or rather him, as Earth's worst man. <laughs> they know about the worst men, all right. This is the Sunday people we're talking about. So we've had douche and douchebaggery. This one was completely new on me. Definition of douche canoe. <laughs> I think we can all agree it needed defining, didn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure if that was my favourite insult. It was either that or self-important twat sack. It's <laughs> 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 <That's> glorious. <laughs> but it wasn't just insults. Some people were threatening physical violence. <laughs> Honestly, I hope she turns around and throws the coffee in his face, to be honest. <laughs> Same person tweeting, poison anyone who orders an English breakfast tea to cover the bases. <laughs> Bloody hell! I was starting to get weirded out. That's not very nice, is it? This is the one that tipped me over the edge. It disgusts me. A woman should be able to get coffee without the threat of serious harassment. <laughs> And I take issue with the idea that this is serious harassment. It isn't serious harassment, is it? Not really. In fact, I would suggest that what he is doing to her is nowhere near as bad as what she is doing to him. For two main reasons. Look at it this way. She is a customer. She can leave. He works there. He can't leave. He is trapped. Two. She's real. He's bloody fictional, isn't he? <laughs> Of course it's different. You know what? I did start to feel a little bad about this situation. It was only meant as a bit of fun, a little bit of mischief on my part, but if it upset someone, if it made them see the world in a worse way, then I feel bad about my contribution to their concerns. And so I took those words. A woman should be able to get coffee without the threat of serious harassment, which incidentally, I agree with wholeheartedly. I don't think anyone here would suggest that no, women should be seriously harassed if they want to get a coffee. I think we'd all agree with that. I took those words and using the same made up email address that I had used to email the Metro, I set up an e-petition, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the title was short and to the point and use the key words to describe it. The title was, A woman should be able to get coffee without the threat of serious harassment. The body of my petition was concise. It was certainly very clear what I was asking the government to do. My petition reads, The treatment meted out to cappuccino one sugar by shiny shoes English breakfast tea, as described in this edition of Metro's Rush Hour Crush, and there's the link, is disgusting. I would like the government to make it illegal for coffee shop customers to flirt with one another in this way. <laughs> there is a gentleman for you all to see. And do you know what? Actually, after all I've said about the government's e-petition website, I have to say, submitting my own petition has, to some extent, restored my faith in the democratic process of 21st century Britain. And I hope you will agree, ladies and gentlemen, when I tell you that my petition about harassment in coffee shops was rejected. <laughs> Quite right too, of course it was, of course it should be. You see, life isn't perfect, but it is goodish. Thanks for watching, see you soon. Good night.